welcome to the Trial Site News podcast series. I'm Dr. Aaron, your host. Thanks for joining in. Today, my guest is an obesity expert, a doctor who's, you may have seen her, she's on the news all the time, Dr. Fatima Cody Stanford. Thank you so much for joining us today. Well, it's a delight to be here. I'm so excited that you've given me the opportunity to share my voice. Absolutely. So you are also, um, you're an obesity expert. You're an associate professor of medicine and pediatrics at Mass General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. And you have a million letters after your name. So you have a bunch of degrees, but um, MD, MPH, MPA, but it's great to have you here and to hear your expertise. Oh, absolutely. You know, for me, you know, gathering those degrees was just a matter of like rounding out who I am and my understanding surrounding, you know, what is by far the most prevalent chronic disease that we've ever had um, in our lifetime. And I would say that that's our parents' lifetime. Our grandparents, great-grandparents is the most prevalent chronic disease ever. And so how do I, you know, use that knowledge that I have on the clinical side and express it through business or public health or public administration, et cetera, because it's such a big problem. We need all sectors approaching Mm -hmm. this. And so having that rounded view really helps me to hopefully make progress. I see that Um, creates a more holistic approach for sure. Um, So obesity has been in the news a lot more lately because of COVID-19. We know that it makes it's a risk factor for more severe disease. And then data just came out showing that rates increased in both adults and kids. We've spoken before and you talk about how obesity should be treated as a disease, called a disease. In your opinion, do you find the narrative shifting on that at all or even the approach? Um, Are we doing more to talk about obesity as a disease and treat it as a disease? I think we are seeing the tide turn in terms of like evaluating obesity as a disease. Um, While glacial in pace, I do think that it is moving, Um, maybe not at the rate of climate change in in the world, but um, it's definitely moving. And the reason why I say that is that if I think back and let's, I'm going to take us 10 years ago, let's do 10 and then we'll take five years ago. So um, 10 years ago in 2012, um, when I first came to, to Boston to do my obesity medicine fellowship, People were like, what? You're doing what? I don't understand. You're going to, to, to see what? I don't understand. Like, what kind of death medicine is that you're going to practice? Like, it was the most bizarre and far-reaching thing that anyone had ever heard of. Um, you know, now when I bring it up, people are kind of like, oh, okay, well, oh, well, oh, I, I guess I need to see you or something. They'll make some type of comment like that. So it's it, there's even a shift in the general population. Let's look at what we see from physicians, you know, which is, you know, on the front lines of, of you know, addressing this disease from a treatment perspective. I see there being like, kind of like, oh, you're an obesity medicine doctor, like, oh, I need to learn some things from you. And so there has been this subtle shift. Now, where I have seen um, the most glacial pace in terms of uh, this acceptance is, you know, at the government finance insurance level in terms of covering obesity, the treatments that we know are evidence-based, we've seen significant um issues with that throughout the U.S. Certain states do it better than others, like Massachusetts, where I'm based, tends to do better than other states. But just because we're doing better doesn't mean we're award-winning, right? So, you know, better just means better. Um, And so I think that there's a lot that still has to be done, but I do think that we are seeing the tides turn in terms of us recognizing obesity for the disease it is and ensuring that patients have the treatments that we know um, are effective for, for their disease. And I have a question down the line here about medications and, and how do people afford those medications. I wanted to ask you, there's been a lot of criticism about public health uh, professionals not talking enough about obesity uh, when addressing COVID-19 in the response. They're like, well, why aren't they telling people to eat better or exercise? Uh, in your opinion, as an obesity doctor, how significant are those factors for addressing obesity as a disease? You know, I think that, you know, I, and actually I'm going to, I'm going to talk about a paper that I I wrote once, and I think this will help you understand my perspective. Um, I think there's food policy and food action, and then there's obesity policy. Obesity is much more complex. And while food and physical activity do play a role, um, and obviously regulating one's weight status, it is so much more complex than that. So if we look at the COVID-19 pandemic and, you know, I've stated this in other interviews before, and I I still believe it to be true, I think that we can all agree that we had an increase in stress during the pandemic, 
regardless of your race, your uh, ethnicity, your socioeconomic status, you know, whatever your stature in life is, we had, you know, stress. We are seeing something that no one had ever seen, no one had ever navigated, no one knew what to do. We still don't completely know what to do. And here we are. So that changed, you know, the, the status quo. We saw this weight increase, right, in both children and adults. You said that at the outset um, of the show today. And that is not just because of our inactivity. I mean, our stress went up. We, we had no end in sight. We still don't know what this quote unquote new normal looks like. So I think we need to recognize that it's a new normal and we aren't going back to what it was like pre-COVID, much like we didn't go back to, to going and walking our family members to the gates post 9-11, right? We changed something and that was a dramatic shift. So we have to recognize that. But my concern, and this goes back to the question you actually asked, is that when we recognize that COVID has become, you know, the number one risk factor for both morbidity, sickness, and mortality, death, with regards to COVID, why are we not recognizing that we need to address address it if we're going to have, you know, great efficacy in terms of response? Um, in addition to to older age, right, like those that are sixty five plus, um, we we know that this is a major risk factor, and diet and exercise are two components that we have to pay attention to. But for many individuals, that's not by itself going to be effective to cause major weight shifts. But right now in the U.S., only about one to two percent of patients that meet criteria for medications get medications, and about one to two percent for surgery. So we're talking about somewhere in the order of what three to four percent that get kind of advanced therapies. You know that would be considered a failure with regards to other disease processes. If I said with diabetes, you know, we're only gonna treat about one to 2% of you, you know, cause really what you need to do is eat less and exercise more and your blood sugar will be better controlled, which is true. But do we just, that's not all we do. We say, oh gosh, we need to augment therapy. We need to figure out how we, you know, get this under control so it doesn't get more advanced. And so what happens with obesity is we, we say, oh, you know, eat less, exercise more, weight keeps increasing you must not be doing that well enough to so do that better. And every single time they come back, they need to do something better, not recognizing, at least on the clinical side, that what can I do to help you be better? Because I need to fix how your brain sees weight and your brain is seeing weight in a different zone of where, where we think would be a healthier weight. So anyway, that's a long answer to say that diet and exercise are, are two small components, but there's there are many other factors that play a role in someone having this disease of and just. To dive in, I, I know you said it's complicated, but to dive into that just a little bit more, okay. um, the complexity there, What is it the set point? I know we did talk yeah, about Yeah, let's, let's talk about it. So, okay. so when we, you know, I, when I, if I were to give this and if we had a visual, which you guys don't have, you're just listening to me talk, um, we know that there are major kind of big umbrellas of things that make, that play a role in one's weight status um, and how the brain regulates weight, which would be things like, you know, food and beverage environment, but also um, maternal and developmental issues, um, you know, psychological um, issues and or stressors, um, issues with regards to um, you know, the built environment, physical activity in terms of those things. We can get into a lot of different factors and genetics, development, environment, and behavior all play a role. So when we're thinking about those, those big umbrellas, we recognize that it's not just a, a calories in, calories out mantra, the one that we've continued to feed literally to people as the way that they become, quote unquote, their healthiest self. Um, and so, you know, if I'm talking to a patient as their, for their initial visit, you know, I find out, oh gosh, well, they, they have a family history of obesity. We know that weight is, is more heritable than height, right? So that they have the strong family history. Okay. That's one strike. Oh my gosh. They started struggling with obesity when they were a child. Okay. Now they're in their early sixties. Okay. Well, that's a long-term history. Oh my gosh. When they got pregnant, each pregnancy, they gained 20 pounds of weight. Okay. Pregnancy was a, a stressor. Um, maybe they were on medications that caused weight gain. You see how like there's so many different factors that could have played a role and my goal is to kind of find what the factors are and see how I can address the factors, um, but recognize that there's some things that are bigger than what we can do in the clinical setting, right? So, right. If you're, you know, so that's important. Yeah, and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that about, I just read an article the other day uh, that went into the percentage of people that were on medication that caused weight gain. 
And that's something that we, you know, you obviously hear about it in uh, the doctor's right. office, but you don't read about that on social media or in the news as much, but that's, agree. yeah, that's a significant factor. Yeah, actually that paper that I think you're referring to is the one that came out from the investigators at the CDC and the NIH, which they demonstrated that 20% of the weight struggles we have in the United States are secondary to medications that we are prescribing for, you know, other issues. And 20%, I mean, that's that's a very sizable percentage of, of weight struggles associated with medications. It's interesting because I just finished watching um, the Janet Jackson documentary. If you guys haven't watched it, I, I do highly recommend it. Um, and in her, in the documentary, she talks about going on birth control and how that led to weight gain. Interestingly enough, I was talking to a friend and she was like, I can't, can't believe that Janet said that she gained weight from this. And I was like, actually, I just saw a patient yesterday that had the same issue and gained up to 60 pounds with, you know, the same, the, you know, uh, the same type of drug. So I think the key thing is, is like not to discount patients when they say, you know, look, I was fine. Then I went on this med and then this happened. You know, if they're in my care, obviously I can immediately see that rise, but if they're not, I have to listen to what they're telling me because they probably have their hand on the pulse of what's going on. So if that's the issue, if the medicine's the issue, then do I need to use that medicine? Is it necessary? If it's not necessary, then it needs to be withdrawn. And so when I heard Janet say that, right, someone that the household name that I could just say her first name and everybody knows who I'm talking about, I think it helped to, I mean, at least in a small part, like normalize that this can happen with even, you know, someone who has obviously immense access and power, et cetera. So um, I do think that, that that plays a large role and it's something I, I pay very close attention to with my patients. Another question about medication. I know there's some new medication out there. One was just approved, I think, in uh, June of 2021. Um, some, 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 I figured, um, I knew I was going to stumble over how to pronounce it. Uh, what are your thoughts on some of these new medications and what are some side effects maybe that people have to worry about if, you know, I could if they experience any. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So first of all, you know, I, you know, I, like I said, right now, only about 1% of patients are using medication. So I, I want to give that as a caveat, but let's, let's look at semaglutide 2.4, which has come on the market, came on actually June 4th of 2021. Obviously I remember that pretty clearly. Um, and the reason why I remember it so clearly is because um, to date, it, it seems to be the most efficacious medication on average. Um, patients lose about 15% of their total body weight um, on the medication at their nat at the nadir, um, which is that low point after um, starting on the medication and titrating up to that 2.4 milligram dose. It's a gradual titration. This is a once weekly ejection. Um, that you would give yourself. There are five different doses, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 1, 1 1.7, and 2.4. Um, typically, people will change doses after being on a dose for a month. So 0 0.25 for a month, 0 0.5 for a month, 1 for a month, 1.7 for a month, and then 2.4. That you would be the maintenance dose. Um, with regards to the side effects, I tell my patients, and that, that I think if there, any of them happen to listen, they would laugh because this is exactly what I tell them. I say, Number um, the, the number one, the number two, the number 20th side effect is nausea. So let's just say nausea is, is number one through 20. And then we get into other issues like constipation, GLP-1s, which is this type of medicine. GLP stands for glucagon-like peptide one. Um, these work in a few key ways in the body. They help stimulate the pathway of the brain that tells you to eat less and store less they slow movement through the GI tract. This is where that constipation comes, comes into play. Um, it improves how your body secretes insulin from the pancreas. And um, it can actually brown your white fat tissue. So if your fat tissue is more brown, it burns, we burn more at rest and with activity. So, um, so it works in kind of those key ways on the body. Um, you know, but like I said, nausea, 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 then constipation. Believe it or not, after that, even though it slows movement through the GI tract, diarrhea comes as, as, as number three. I, I hear that very rarely, um, but you know, it, it's if you were looking at the package insert, that's kind of the order that you would see things in. Um, now, the key thing is that uh, with the GLP-1 agonist like semaglutide is that these side effects appear to be transient. So if you're having nausea, 
um, let's say when you first start, as you kind of remain on that 0.25, your body gets acclimated, then you move to that next dose. Maybe as you're shifting to that next dose, ooh, oh, I noticed that, you know, I have that nausea. And then as you kind of get to maintenance and, you know, you'll eventually find that that abates over time. Interesting. I wanted to, uh, you touched on it earlier, the cost of these medications, and a lot of them are not covered by uh, insurers, including Medicare. I read that that's why a lot of people end up taking a generic drug and they have to pay out of pocket. So yeah, it's, it's very frustrating. So let's talk about the current status of coverage yeah. in the United States. I think this is a huge issue. And this is if you remember the question I answered earlier, like, you know, I feel like medicine is starting to recognize this disease. I think that, um, you know, government and insurance is really lagged far behind this recognition, which then of course impedes our ability to deliver the best possible care to our patients. So right now um, under Medicare, Medicare we know sets the stage for what everyone else does. Medicare, it is an exclusion under Medicare Part D to have any anti-obesity medications covered. They are completely excluded from Medicare Part D. Now, I don't agree with it, but it's the current status quo. So we've been trying to get a bill through both the House and Senate since 2013, uh, just nine years, um, called the Treat and Reduce Obesity Act. The Treat and Reduce Obesity Act is a bipartisan bill, both in the House and the Senate. And the goal is to cover two different things. Number one, behavioral therapy for the treatment of obesity, which means like work with a dietitian, and number two, medications for the treatment of obesity, since they're currently excluded. I told you we've been trying to get it through for nine years. It has not made it across the finish line. I think it needs to be part of like, if you're thinking about reconciliation and other big things that come through, you know, Congress, it needs to be attached to that. Because like I said, this intertwining of like, separating obesity from COVID is problematic. I mean, right now, Biden's working on his moonshot for cancer. 15 cancers are caused by obesity, yet we're not, that's not somehow included. Do you see? So I feel like we're doing is we're treating all of the downstream impacts of the obesity, but we don't treat the obesity itself. It's like, we forget the elephant in the room. Let's go treat all the little things around the elephant. So, so coverage has remained um, problematic. Um, but if Medicare were to get on board, cover medications, you can imagine the trickle down effect that would do to private insurers, employer sponsored insurance like I have and you have, or those that are on Medicaid, right? So Medicare sets the standards. If we can get Medicare to come on board, then we should see everyone else fall into place. Now, Massachusetts, I mentioned that we have the best coverage in the country. And the reason why I made that comment is because all of our employer sponsored insurance plans that are based here in Massachusetts will cover these anti-obesity medications if you happen to be employed by one of the companies that has employer-sponsored insurance. However, if you have MassHealth, which is our equivalent of Medicaid or Medicare, then those medications are not covered. And then I have to use generics and can't get access to like, for example, that blockbuster drug that we talked about that's magnetite a little bit earlier. So that's the current lay of the land in terms of coverage. Um, now, interestingly enough, you could get surgery covered in almost every state, but hmm. I can't get your medications covered. Wow. Hmm. So you see that you see there's, <laughs> just yeah. I do see that. <laughs> so yeah, um, yeah, I'll let you guys make your own decisions. Um, wow, I just can't believe, you know, cause this has been a problem in our country and the fact that 13 years, nine years, was it? 13? Nine years. Nine years and nothing. I wonder where we would be if, it did, if that bill did get No, through. right? This is exactly, yeah. you know, we have now over 4,000 physicians that are board certified in obesity medicine. There are, there are close to a hundred of us that have done fellowship and then the rest have done like um, certification through taking courses taught by like persons like myself and others. But okay, so we now are building up a workforce. We're doing these things, but you know, sorry, we won't cover that for you. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. I did not know that. Um, yes. Okay, I want to shift gears here. Uh, okay. And we talked about this before, weight bias. Oh, and, and I, well, I don't love the topic. I hate that, I, that, that this is a topic, but I, I love being able to speak on this topic. Yeah, uh, I actually thought of you yesterday because I read an article 
you might have seen it. There was a company that was creating cards and the card said, please don't weigh me. Yeah, no, I was in the article, the Washington Post. Oh, you were? I, yeah, okay. yeah I'm, I'm, the, I'm the key doctor in there. So yeah, so. Oh, so, okay, I'll, perfect. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I don't I'll know if like, I read the Washington Post because of the paywall. Oh, oh no, no, it's a free, it's free. It's a free thing. I'll, I'll put it, I'll put it in the chat for you after, after we conclude. But um, so yes, yeah, so let's talk about these cards. I can't, I'm so glad you brought this up. And I'm, the interview literally just went live, I think about 36 hours ago go so from the Washington Post but um okay. there were these cards that were created um that people would basically hand to their doctors that say would say don't weigh me unless it's absolutely necessary um and I can give my informed consent to be weighed and so one of my quotes in that story just because I, I did a post on on um, social media said you know I said the following I think that the card should be changed to say um you know, I'm happy to be weighed, but please don't provide any negative or derogatory comments to me about my weight when I'm weighed. Because I think that's really the crux of the issue. People get weighed and then there's some type of negative comment or some condescending attacking comment that happens once that person is weighed, whether that's by the doctor or by the medical staff or whomever, there's usually not like a positive, unless someone just happens to be lean. And, oh, look how lean you are, right? Like that's a comment. But you know, typically it's it's a negative and condescending comment. And this explains why people don't like to go to the doctor um, or don't like to go to advanced practice providers like NPs or PAs because they're like, when I go, like they're gonna say something about my weight, but I really came in for a hangnail, you know, like or something like that. Um, so I, I think that this these cards, and I, I basically state this, I think they come from the tremendous bias that people experience in healthcare. Um, yeah. They know that if they have excess weight, they're going to be judged. You know, they're going to tell their doctor, hey, doc, I've been, been eating healthy, I've been exercising. The doc's like, really, have you? I don't know. Shouldn't you be better than this if you're doing what you say you're doing? Um, even I was during this course of this past weekend, I was teaching a summit on obesity and with, with all doctors. And, you know, I would put up like a scenario or a case and, and they were like, well, you know, are they really exercising? How do we know? And I'm like, well, they just, they just, just said that, <laughs> you know. But you know, maybe we should do a little more digging. So like, like let's just acknowledge that the patients are probably telling us the right thing so we can help them be their best self. And let's not assume that if someone has excess weight that they can't be training for a half marathon or a marathon. I mean, part, part of why they may be motivated may be, hey, I think this will help address my weight. So I'm gonna do this work and you know, be given the benefit of the doubt. So these cards, I think are just a testament to the tremendous amount of weight bias that happens. Um, right in healthcare. And as I was, when I read it, I said, um, you know, I, I went to a military academy for college and oh, they would, they would knock on our door at 5 a.m. and we'd get weighed in and oh, really? they'd shout, they'd, or, or even earlier and they'd shout out your weight. And oh wow, it was awful. Cause if you were a little bit overweight and you know, at the academy, they'd some, they'd give you like 3000 calories a day. And you know, when yeah. you weren't training, doing army training, um, you might eat that and you might gain weight and it was mortifying. So I understood, I, I, I wanted to make sure everyone understands that like she understands as a doctor, I understand having experiences too, just like it is, it can be embarrassing for that, right. like the way in. And then if you, if you didn't make weight, oh my gosh, it was awful. And there were a lot of eating disorders. Um, I had an eating disorder, so I get oh, it. Interesting, yeah. Um, but how does that, and, and this is part, I think of a larger societal movement right. to, you know, body positive, stop yes. being fat phobic. We hear these yeah. things. So how do I balance that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How you balance yeah, yeah. that? I absolutely, I think I do a really good job because I, when I, I can tell, well, <laughs> I'll let you guys decide that, but I'll tell you why I think that um, <laughs> when patients come in and they will tell you this, if you, I have thousands of patients, just go find one on the street somewhere um, and be like, does Dr. Stanford ever give you a target weight? They, most of them are frustrated that I don't give them a target weight, but I'm very, the reason why I don't give them a target weight is for, for a variety of reasons. Number one, the BMI charts and tables aren't based upon science. They're based upon actuarial data. So why am I going to then give you a target based upon something that's not even based out of medicine, number one. Um, they, it, the BMI doesn't apply very well to racial ethnic minority populations. That's where I, the, comp, the group I come from. So why are we gonna do that? That doesn't make any sense. Number three, let's say someone comes in and I'm gonna use an example of a patient that I think really captures this idea of like not seeking a target weight. So this gentleman came in to me at 550 pounds, BMI around 70, 72, somewhere in there. Um, with different treatment modalities, we were able to get him down to about a BMI of like 42, um, down about 250 pounds. 
So 300 pounds. Now, if you were to see him walking down the street, you might be like, you know, he needs to work on his weight, not recognizing that he's 250 pounds down from where he was and that he has no metabolic disease at the 300 pounds, whereas he had a lot of metabolic issues at 550 pounds. So I'm body positive, meaning I acknowledge that this is where his body is. He's been hanging out here for about five years with the 300, not the 550 where we started and his metabolic health appears ideal. So I believe in acknowledge, accepting, and encouraging him at that particular way. I don't think he needs to be whatever his BMI says, which would, you know, obviously put him in a much lower threshold. The problem where I've run into the issue or the kerfuffle um, with some of the body positive community is that let's not pretend like the excess weight does not cause, you know, I don't know, over 200 diseases. With this gentleman, we were able to do a deep dive, investigate his entire health profile, including his weight, shift him into a weight category for him that eliminates those issues. But to not do that evaluation and to not recognize that adipose, i.e. fat, leads to major diseases and neglect that that's a potential, which it is not just a potential, it's the reality, that's where my where, where I don't overlap. Um, if you are in charge of the public health response to obesity, what would you prioritize first? Oh, this is a this is a tougher one, Erin. Let's see. Um, <laughs> who <laughs> you give me the like he's the kingdom. <laughs> it's um, okay, so I think the first thing you know I would first is just ensure that there's coverage for evidence based therapies. That would be my number one thing to do because I think that if we have the coverage of the therapies, then we don't have the resistance that docs face. You know, when trying to consider these therapies. Um, people will often, and so this kind of will deviate from some people like, oh, Dr. Schaefer, she's not talking about the public health component. They'll be like, well, just focus on prevention. The problem is, is that a majority of our country has overweight and obesity. We're talking the order of close to 70%. So we can focus on just the 30%, but I, you know, I kind of like to take, take a check out of the bigger number, right? Like, so let's, let's deal with the fact that we have this disease and a large majority of individuals, when we're looking at overweight and obesity, over, you know, obesity, around 43%, but then you add overweight, you know, we're getting closer to 70%, you know, 67, 68, depending upon what you're looking at. The whole point, a lot of people. So I feel like if we can better cover therapies that we know work, why, why is it that you have to get diabetes now to work with a dietitian? So you have to get the diabetes to work with a dietitian, but I could just give you to the dietitian before you get diabetes. And I just, so to me, that logically makes sense. I mean, there's just, it's just logic. I mean, not, this is, this is not rocket science people. So I, I would, that would definitely be my number one thing. Um, you didn't ask for number two and number three, but I'm going to give it to you, Erin, just because you have given me the mic. So number two would be better education about this disease universally um, in medical schools, residencies, fellowships, NP schools, nursing schools, physician assistant schools, everyone in healthcare needs to know how to treat this disease. And, you know, number three, I think, you know, making sure that we reduce weight bias and stigma by, you know, how we portray patients with obesity in the media, et cetera. For example, there's a story that just came out yesterday. I won't name the station that I'm in the story, and I told them, you know, I don't want derogatory B-roll in the story. And then as I'm looking at it, I'm like, oh God, they did exactly what I told them not to do. We have to respect these individuals. It's just like I would want to be respected as a Black female. I would want to respect these individuals that have this disease. Um, I don't treat them any differently because of, of their weight status. It doesn't de determine their value or their worth as a human much like my race doesn't determine my value worth as a human. And so I, I really see those as kind of the key things I would do, but, but access would be number one. I mean, I think access is a public health issue right. for sure. Thank you so much, Dr. Cody Stanford for joining in. And I know you have a book that you've written. Yes. Uh, I know you do a lot of research. And yes. so if people want to find you, I'm sure there will be people here can you give us your Yeah, website? absolutely. Well, first of all, I on um, social media, this would be Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. My handle is at ask, A-S-K, Dr. D-R Fatima, F-A-T-I-M-A. So ask Dr. Fatima. Um, feel free to, you know, connect with me on any of those platforms. Um, I do try to post. Um, LinkedIn is, 
is where I shine the most, um, but I think that I do a decent job on the other platforms um, of, for both Twitter and Instagram. Um, and I think that's a good way. The book that you mentioned is on Amazon. It's called Facing Overweight and Obesity, A Complete Guide for Children and Adults. Um, it was a book that we published here out of Mass General. Um, so I think you'll find that very helpful. It really covers a broad swath of information surrounding this disease. Um, and I think if you really want to do a deep dive and kind of learn about the disease, the thing I would recommend you do is, is Google Radcliffe, R-A-D-C-L-I-F-F-E, Fatima, F-A-T-I-M-A. And there is going to be a, a video you can watch. It's called Obesity. It's more complex than you think. Um, and I think you really get a chance to understand why I'm calling this a disease, how patients can, can benefit from therapies on a chronic basis for their chronic disease, and how invested I am into to, in shifting the narrative surrounding this disease here in the US and around the world. Thank you so much. I'll uh, post the link to that video okay. in the podcast description. And thank you for everyone for tuning in. And um, yes, hope you guys found that informative. I know I did.